my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree his body Him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone. Messiah still, and all alone. Sing, oh, praise the name of the
Welcome to the last day of Keswick Convention 2023. 20, I should say 2022. Uh, I was getting carried away. It's been a, a really extraordinary three weeks. Um, I'll say a bit more tonight, but it's lovely to have you here in the main tent. I know many of you still flocking in. Also great to have you joining on the relay and online. It's great to have you here. It's really encouraging to hear some little messages and notes come in. Here from Tom, Tom on Twitter. Up in the lakes, enjoying our first time at KESCONF 2022. The scenery is incredible, isn't it just? Uh, we've enjoyed worship times led by Oli and his team. We've really valued the teaching from Martin Salter on the character of Jacob. The kids have loved their groups too. So wonderful, it's the whole family, refreshment and recreation around God's word. And another photo here from Chloe. What a picture that is. <laughs> Who's been enjoying the Keswick for Kids program this week. What a great picture. Thank you very much, Chloe and Pep family for that. Do keep sending them in. You can catch up um, and see photos and so on afterwards. Hashtag KesConf22 or at tag at Keswick Ministries for that. But now as we gather together, let's pause and pray together, shall we? Just a moment to still our hearts. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for the hope that we have. Thank you for your relentless grace. Thank you for your kindness to us. And as we meet and sing your praise and hear your word this morning, would you meet with us by your Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. Let's praise. Stronger than darkness, you every morning. 
mercy that we can know day after day. Thank you so much that our debt has been paid completely. Our sins, they are many, but your mercy is more. Praise you, God. Amen. Amen. If you're a regular to uh, Keswick Convention, you'll have noticed there's something different this year as we've not been passing the buckets round. But our offerings, our giving is very much part of our worship and our expression of gratitude to the Lord. I know many of you will have given, be giving or planning to give, whether it's online or through our forms, but we thought it would be really good just to pause and take stock and to commit that giving to the Lord. So what we're going to do is have just a moment of quiet, just to reflect as we give ourselves and reflect on that, and then I'm going to chance all of us together to join in some words from one chronicles. But let's just have a moment of quiet first. And so with the words behind us, let's join together in these words. David, praise the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. Amen. Amen. Just a couple of notices, things to highlight. Uh, excuse me, coming up over the next while, just for you for interest. The first thing that Keswick Ministries does to highlight is the church's weekend away. I know many of us really value the chance to come away, and it's great to come away together. But especially in smaller churches, it could be quite hard to pull the infrastructure together and make a church weekend away possible, especially during COVID. So one of the new initiatives we will be in the pencil factory, I hope you've had a chance to see it, is a church's weekend away. The idea is that if you're a smallish church, up to 100 people or so, you can come away with, and there'll be a number of other churches, up to about, I guess, a maximum of around six churches. John Risbridge will be bringing God's word to us and speaking over the weekend. Colin Webster and Phil Moore will be leading the sun worship. So it'll be like a kind of mini version of Keswick, but for a small number of churches. If that's of interest to you, then do have a look at the website for that. It's the 31st of March to the 2nd of April next year. And the other thing to highlight is you've probably had a chance to see either from kids or wandering around one of the tours and so on, or just had a look inside the pencil factory. There are lots and lots of facilities that Keswick Ministries has here. There's a Skidder Street site, and where there's accommodation, you can book that for youth groups or for times away, that kind of thing. Or you, and there's accommodation there. Or there's the Rawnsley site, or of course the pencil factory. So different rooms, different sizes, which all I hope will be useful for you to come away as church groups or whatever it might be for that. More details on the website. It's been a real uh, treat over these last days, has it not, to be in the life of Jacob and to think about as... Uh, God's relentless grace towards Jacob as he's, uh, God's been working in him and shaping and fashioning him. And it's been a real joy, Martin, to have you uh, speaking for us. Thank you for stepping in uh, when Mike was unable to be here. Thank you for bringing God's word with such passion and clarity and faithfulness. And we had many comments, many appreciative comments. So I want to say a huge thank you. And perhaps we can all show appreciation to Martin. Thank you. Thank you. 
and we look forward to final exposition in a few moments. But the Bible readings wouldn't be complete without the irrepressible Jonathan Carswell. Morning. <laughs> Thanks. Great to be with you. So, um, uh, just a reminder, practical details. So we we close just before the um, the evening session uh, tonight. So uh, this afternoon's your your time. But if you're watching online or you you forget and you get home, then you can of course uh, visit ten of those.com forward slash Keswick, and then you can uh, pick up the things that we've either sold out of or you, you forgot to get and you want to get. Let me just encourage you, and I know some of you are already doing this, which is great, but let me encourage you to think of others that you can uh, be getting books for, to be helping them in their walk with the Lord. Maybe they're not even yet a Christian and you want to present something that will uh, uh, point them to the Lord Jesus. Think of other people as, as gifts. There's only 21 Saturdays till Christmas now, so you do need to hurry and... Um, Think, think of others as you, as you get things. Just a reminder on the, uh, on, on the Keswick resources, the 30-day devotions. This is a new one this year on holiness. And uh, wouldn't that be a great gift with, a, I don't know, some Kendall Mint Cake and a book? Kendall Mint Cake without a book isn't complete. So do get both. And, uh, and then perhaps give, give one to a friend. Um, they're five pounds each. We'll do, um, let's do three for ten. Leave the five pound sti- sticker on. Your friend will think you're very generous. <laughs> They don't need to know, okay? They're probably watching on live stream, so they will know. But anyway, three, you can get three for 10 quid on, on, on the holiness. But um, I don't know about you, but I've always found my prayer life a, a real battle. It, it has just never come easy. And so uh, we're thinking yesterday we were about Jacob crying out to the Lord. And what about those times where we feel like God isn't answering? Or what do we say to him? And I, I'm, I'm always on the lookout for books that are going to help me in my prayer life because I desperately need help. And I've read uh, quite a number now, but this has been the most helpful and also the most practical, taking good theology, but then, then rooting it in real everyday life. You know, sometimes those books, that they, they can be a bit distant from here. Yeah, but what, in real life, how does that work out? Paul Miller has written an outstanding book called A Praying Life. And I know a number of people who've read this who've said that book just transformed action in, uh, it, after I read it. It wasn't just filling my head with good knowledge, but led to different action. Paul has a, a challenging family situation, and he uses that to speak into what prayer life can look like. And those times where prayer is difficult, how it is that our our good theology of prayer can change our application of of how we're praying. And then at at the end, he has some very practical steps of of how you can be using certain things to help in your prayer life. If you're a bit like me and you're a, a struggler when it comes to prayer, I really commend this one to you, A Praying Life by Paul Miller. It's not just gonna fill your head, but it's gonna help with your application to be talking each day with our Heavenly Father. Thank you, Jonathan. Yes. As you, I hope you'd have realised over the week as well, and maybe from the website, Keswick Ministries also offers some teaching and training events through the year. And one of the ones we've done is in partnership with Living Leadership. It's called the Pastoral Refreshment Conference. It's aimed for those in full-time pastoral ministry. I'm delighted to have Anna Price here. Anna, with her husband Matthew, came to. Uh, the recent one. Anna, just tell us where you are and what you're doing. Uh, we are in Goulston near Great Yarmouth in East Norfolk. So um, quite away from here. Quite away from here. We've got a long journey this afternoon to get, to get back home. And we're part of a church. Can I tell them about Yeah, please do, yes. We're part of a, a church that's seeking to be transformed by Christ, but also then transforming our community, both in word but also in action so we're heavily involved in a very deprived um, part of the town with food bank community groups of every shape and size and trying to make a difference in in letting Christ transform every aspect of our community wonderful thank you and you see you came with Matthew to the pastor refreshment conference why did you come and, and how was it helpful for you we need somewhere to go, somewhere to get away, somewhere where we can stop, put down a marker, listen to God's word, be in fellowship with other people who have some understanding of what we're experiencing um, in church leadership. Um, this year in particular, I mean, we've been going for the last few years, but this year I, I somehow deeply knew I needed a circuit breaker. I was operating in a way that was 
entirely unsustainable. Um, a comment that had been made to me the week before we came away was, Anna, you seem to be more concerned with the tasks than the people, which was a devastating um, description of where I'd got to, because that's not my interest at all. Um, so we needed a circuit breaker. It was there. We went. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Now you're going to bring God's word from Genesis 35, reading it, and then Martin's going to preach for us. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you speak through what you've spoken. As your word is read and preached by your Holy Spirit, would you transform us? Thank you that your word does not return to you void. It accomplishes the purpose for which you sent it. So would you work in our hearts, we pray, for we would see Jesus. Amen. Amen. So we're reading from Genesis chapter 35, verses 1 to 15. Then God said to Jacob, go up to Bethel and settle there and build an altar there to God who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, get rid of your foreign gods that you have, get rid of the foreign gods you have with you and purify yourselves and change your clothes. Then come, let us go up to Bethel, where I will build an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress and who has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods they had and the rings in their ears. And Jacob buried them under the oak at Shechem. Then they set out and the terror of God fell on the towns all around them so that no one pursued them. Jacob and all the people with him came to Luz, that is Bethel, in the land of Canaan. There he built an altar and he called the place El Bethel because it was there that God revealed himself to him when he was fleeing from his brother. Now, Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, died and was buried under the oak outside Bethel. So it was named Alon Bacchus. After Jacob returned from Paddan Aram, God appeared to him again and blessed him. God said to him, your name is Jacob, but you will no longer be called Jacob. Your name will be Israel. So he named him Israel. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and increase in number. A nation and a community of nations will come from you, and kings will be among your descendants. The land I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I also give to you. And I will give this land to your descendants after you. Then God went up from him at the place where he had talked with him. Jacob set up a stone pillar at the place where God had talked with him. And he poured out a drink offering on it. He also poured oil on it. Jacob called the place where God had talked with him Bethel. Well, uh, good morning again for, sadly, the final time this week. Now the end is near. And uh, I want to begin just by um, just saying a big thank you to, uh, to James and the team uh, and to you for kind of so graciously uh, receiving me. I'm aware I was kind of subbed in last minute and you might have felt slightly disappointed by that as you looked at the program. Um, but you've been really kind and really gracious. Uh, you've refreshed my heart as you've come and talked to me about what you've enjoyed. And, uh, and, and I, do, I really hope and pray that, that as you go, uh, you will have really enjoyed looking at the life of Jacob, as, as challenging as it is. 
Uh, my prayer has been throughout that you'll have really heard God speak to you through, through the narrative. Um, so that's, that's my prayer, and I want to just express my thanks to you for your kindness as we've gone through this. Uh, we come to Genesis 35 this morning, and um, I wonder if any of you have been watching the, the Commonwealth Games. I don't know if any of you are sports fans. I'm, I confess I'm, I'm a little bit of a sports nut. Like I'm, I'm, I'm rubbish at everything playing it, uh, but, but I'll watch almost anything. Um, I, I even watched this morning before I came out the Crown Green Bowls, which is amazing, right? I'd, I'd taken the, the, we'd gone as a family early in the week to have a go in Keswick, and you realise just how hard it is. I so see you're watching these people, you're watching their skill level, and you're thinking, wow, these, these, these people are incredible, they're proper athletes. Well, they're not athletes, but they're skillful. <laughs> and um, one of the things I love watching as well, I, all of it, is the, uh, the cycling, the track cycling is, is just the, the speed, the, the power, the skill is, is incredible. And some of you may know, if, you, if you're interested in cycling, you may know the name of uh, Sir Dave Brailsford. Uh, so Dave Brailsford was, was formerly the sort of director of British Cycling and then Team Sky. And, and the reason that he's famous was uh, he, he developed this, this kind of this term of trying to talk about little improvements with, with the team and with the setup, which he, which he kind of he came with this term of what he called marginal gains. Have you, have you heard of that phrase? Marginal gains. This was, this was the idea that just, just little 1% improvements wherever they could, and, and I guess each one on their own wouldn't, wouldn't make that big a difference, but when you start to put them together, and when the margins of winning and losing are so fine, these things made all the difference. Some, some of them are quite extraordinary. They, um, they kind of developed with a the company these, these, these helmets for the riders that reduced the, kind of the drag coefficient by 1%. It cost thousands to develop, but they, they did it. They tried to shave like just kind of 1% of the weight off the bike. They put them in these kind of these suits, which again were supposed to just, just reduce the drag by just a, a tiny fraction. They micromanaged every aspect of their diet. They even took with them the same mattress and pillow for each cyclist so that every night they slept on exactly the same mattress, exactly the same pillow, so that sleep wouldn't be a factor in their Recovery. It was kind of. It was like it was an obsession with the pursuit of perfection. But it made them incredibly successful. And the reason I kind of start there is because, in some ways, what, what we're going to see as we look at this last chapter together, one of the challenges is we see as, as Jacob's life is, is is really been turned and is now in a much better place. His direction of travel is good. Is one of the things he's he's doing. He's learning to do is, is throw off everything. That's holding them back. It's, it's that kind of that Hebrews 12, 1 principle. Let us throw off everything that entangles that we may run. And that is in some ways what, what he's doing is, is, as they get rid of the idols and as the, he sets out on the journey he was supposed to finish earlier. That is really what is happening. Just to, to, to remind us, to, to reorient ourselves to us, as we've looked at these chapters, we've, we've seen this relentless pursuit of God, the relentless grace of God with rat bags like Jacob and actually rat bags like us. In some ways we might say the moral of the story is that your morals don't get you into God's story. That's, that's, that's a nice little takeaway from the story of Jacob, isn't it? The story of the Bible. The moral of the story is your morals won't get you into God's story. Jacob's family is dysfunctional his behavior has been despicable, but for decades, undeserved grace has been after him all the way. And as we, as we get to the, toward the end of, of his story, we see this fresh result as he's met with God and as, as God has kind of turned him upside down, as he's come to the place of submission and surrender, he's found that path to blessing, and now his life is on this new course and this morning, there's just two headings, really, just two things I want us to notice in this final chapter, and uh, I'll give you them now, and we'll do them. Uh, get rid of anything holding you back, and follow God with everything you've got. Those are the two headings. So here's the first one. Uh, get rid of anything that is holding you back. 
And that's what we see as we, uh, as we begin. Chapter 35 and verse 1. Then God said to Jacob, Go up to Bethel and settle there and build an altar there to God who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. You may remember as we, as we left off yesterday, the, the journey had begun, hadn't it? It, it started to head back toward the promised land. But you remember as we got to the end of the chapter, he'd he'd stopped short for some reason we don't know. He'd stopped at Shechem, 20 miles short, and he'd he'd kind of settled there. And there was something of the sort of the, he'd not quite committed to total obedience. But here at the start of 35, there's a a call to, to go back, finish what you started, go to Bethel. In some ways, it's kind of, it's fulfill the vow. You remember the vow he made in chapter 28? If God will be with me and watch over me on this journey I am taking, will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely, then the Lord will be my God. This stone will be God's house. And I'll give you a tenth. So he's finally come to this point, some kind of 20 years later on from the vow, maybe more actually, where he's going to go. And he's going to make good on his promise. And so in verse 2, Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, get rid of the foreign gods you have with you and purify yourselves and change your clothes. There's the kind of clothes thing again. You know, remember, he'd been wearing the clothes of deceit earlier in his life. He says, change the clothes. Purify yourselves. Then come. Let us go up to Bethel. And I'll build that altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress and who has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods they had and the rings in their ears and he buried them under the oak at Shechem. You may wonder where of of all these things, where's all this kind of plunder, where's it come from? There's a couple of places that we we might see it. Uh, We... We didn't have a chance to look at these chapters, but in 31, verse 19, uh, when, when Jacob is resolved he's going to leave Laban, he's going to leave the toxic influence of Laban. God has appeared to him uh, again and told him to leave. And, and as he goes, we're told in verse um, 19 that Rachel stole her father's household gods. These are, these are probably the idols that are referred to here. Uh, Rachel has, has stolen all, all the idols, all the little statues, uh, whatever they were that, that Laban worshipped, these pagan idols. For some reason, Rachel has nicked them and, and taken them and seems to have kept hold of them. And, and Jacob knows they're still in the household, they're still in the possession. He says, look, they've, they've got to go. All of that, all of that past, all they symbolise, all they represent, uh, we can't hang on to it anymore. It's, it's got to be cleared out. And the rings, well, again, they're, they're, the story of their origin might not be great either. In uh, chapter 34, I just alluded to this at the end yesterday, when uh, Dina is uh, sexually assaulted in Shechem, and her brothers take revenge by basically slaughtering most of the inhabitants. And, uh, and when they do, uh, we're told in verse 27 of chapter 34, the sons of Jacob came upon the dead bodies and they looted the city where their sister had been defiled, they seized flocks and herds, donkeys, everything else of theirs in the city and out in the fields. They carried off all their wealth and all their women and children, taking as plunder everything in the houses. Perhaps the rings and the, and the gold possessions are, it's kind of this ill-gotten gain. The, the sins of, uh, the, 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 the plunder of their sin. And Jacob says, that's got to go too. The idols, the ill-gotten gain, everything that is kind of related to the, the sinfulness of our past, that's, it's got to go. It's got to be buried. We've got to leave it behind. We can't cherish any of it any longer. We can't hang on to it. All of that has got to be left. And it's got to be buried. And as we read that, we might think, okay, I understand that, but that's not, it's not really our problem, is it? I don't... I don't know about you, but in my household, on my mantelpiece, I don't, I don't have any little statues. I don't have any little golden gods. I don't have any altars set up in my home that I, that I bow down to. 
first commandment says, doesn't it? You, you have no other gods but me. And we think, yeah, tick. We need to think a bit more carefully, don't we? I want to encourage you to think a bit more carefully about the shape that idolatry can take, the forms it can take. And uh, one of the things we need to, to, to notice about the ancient world, because I think it helps us think about idolatry, is um, idolatry then, it, it wasn't a simple thing. Idolatry in the ancient world, it wasn't a case of you kind of, you swap Yahweh and instead you worship Baal. You, 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 kind of, you remove Yahweh out and you, you worship Molech or Chemosh or, or whatever the pagan god was. You, you swap one and you worship another. It was much more murky. It was much more like, um, it was much more like hedging your bets. Now, you'll be, you'll be pleased to know I, I really know nothing about betting. Um, but as I understand it, that there's some ways of betting which means you don't just have to pick one, but you can pick multiple outcomes. You can, you can spread your bets. You can, you can bet on, if you, if, if, if you were betting on horses, you could bet this horse would win. But you might also bet on two or three others. Or you might bet that this horse will win, but you also might put a bet that it comes second or third. And, and as you do that, you kind of, you're managing your risk. You're, you're not fully committed to one. You're committed to a number of places. And if one doesn't come off, then maybe another will. That's, that's kind of what ancient idolatry was. They actually had loads of gods. They would have gods for the, the seasons. They'd have gods for the harvest. They'd have gods for the weather. They'd have gods for war. They'd have gods for fertility. And you kind of worship all of them. And, and hopefully one of them at some point would come good. See, here's the thing. To, to be an idolater, you don't have to stop worshipping Yahweh. You, you can be an idolater and worship Yahweh... It's just that you've also got a few other things that you're putting your hope in. Actually, God's challenge to the people will be, actually, it doesn't work like that. If you're really worshipping Yahweh, you can't have the other things. It's a bit like the, um, have you ever been presented with the, a choice which is, is, is either or, or kind of both ands? A both and choice that feels like you don't have to pick one, you can have multiples. Um, if, if you go to... If you go to Nando's, I don't know how many of you frequent Nando's. Uh, we've, got a, we've got a Nando's in Bedford because we're, we're a classy town. And uh, when you go to Nando's, you, you're forced to choose, aren't you, between the chips and the rice as a side. And I kind of think, that, that shouldn't be an either-or choice. That should be a both-and, right? I should be able to have the chips and the rice. Or if you go to Sunday lunch with somebody and, and you, you have a nice roast dinner and they pull out the desserts and they pull out a cheesecake and a chocolate gateau. And you're looking at your host thinking, I hope this is a both and situation. <laughs> this doesn't have to be either or. I'd really like a, a bit of both. We were at a restaurant last night having a, a, a meal as a family with a friend. And um, as, as they, they brought the pudding menu, my daughter said, can I have the chocolate fudge cake, please? And they said, would you like ice cream or whipped cream? I'm like, both. Like, I want both. So how idolatry worked in the ancient world. I, I, want, I want all of these things. And God says, no, it's either or. Like, it really is. If, if you're really going to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength, you, you can't have these other things. But that's how it, it kind of works for them. That's how it can work for us, isn't it? You, you don't have to throw out God to be committing the sin of idolatry. You've just got to add some other things next to him. How does that, how does that work itself out? For us, what, is, what, what does that kind of look like in our lives? It's, it's a subtle thing, isn't it? If, if idolatry can be this kind of this complex smorgasbord of options, it's a difficult thing. One writer wrote this, whatever you are searching for and chasing after, that reveals the God that is winning the war for your hearts. It's worth thinking about, isn't it? Whatever you're searching for, whatever it is you're chasing after, that's the God that's really winning the war for your hearts. Or as Martin Luther put it, whatever your heart clings to and confides in, that is really your God, your functional saviour. 
there's an American writer called uh, Jamie Smith, and, and he's written about this, and he says, you know, we, we tend to think post-enlightenment that we are, we are intellectual beings, that we're kind of brains on sticks, and, and if we fill our heads with information, we'll make the right choices, but we know that's not really how we live, because... Well, I know how much exercise I'm supposed to take, and I, I know how many fruit and veg I'm supposed to take, but I still don't do it. Information enough isn't going to cut it, is it? And Jamie Smith says, no, no, we, the problem is we're, we're not so much intellectual beings, we're, we're emotional creatures. We're, we're creatures of desire. And this is how idolatry works in our lives, is we, we, kind of, we point ourselves at a vision of the good life. We point ourselves at that object, whatever it is we think, if I point myself at that, that will give me what I need. That will fill me, that will satisfy me, that will give me that sense of purpose, that will reward me. And so we, we pitch ourselves that way. We're creatures of desire. There's a great story of, uh, of an Olympian called Matt Emmons. I don't know if you've ever heard the name. He was, uh, he was competing. He was a, one of the world's best rifle shooters. And it's, it's 2004, Athens, the Olympics. And he's competing in the 50-meter rifle shooting. And uh, going into the final round, he was way ahead. In fact, all he had to do was, he just had to hit the target. He didn't even need a bullseye. If he just hit the target, he was going to win. So Matt Amons, he, he kind of, he, he took up his position. He went through his process. He stilled himself. He slowed his breathing right down. Took aim. Held his breath. Pull the trigger. Straight through the bullseye. In a moment, he thinks there's elation. But then kind of like half a second afterwards, his, his elation turns to absolute horror. As he realises, he's lined himself up on the wrong target. He went from first to eighth and came away with Nothing. I think he's fine about it. He dines out on the story. Seems to do pretty well on it. But, you know, you can, you can get a bullseye in life aiming at something that will reward you with nothing. You can line yourself up on something. You can hit the absolute bullseye. But if it's the wrong target, what have you gained? How do we, how do we, what, what does this look like for you? Some of, the, some of the examples, I guess, are they're kind of obvious, aren't they? You, you know them, they'll be familiar to you. Things like your, your career. Is that, is, is that where you've lined yourself up on? Your, your career, the, the progression, the, the promotions, the title, the salary, the, the, the esteem. Is that, is that the thing that will, you think, that, you know, if I, if I just keep going, the next, the next stage, that'll fill me. That, that'll provide That'll give me security. That'll give me that sense of purpose and meaning and, and worth. Is it relationships? Is it that sense of, you know, the, if, if, if only I can meet the one, then I'll really be happy. So, yeah, I know, I know God gives some people the gift of singleness and some people the gift of marriage, but, 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 I, but I know, you know, if, 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 that, if I meet the one, then, then I'll really, then I'll know what it is to be really fulfilled. Or children, if God gives me children, if God gives me a family, then I'll, then I'll be complete. Then our little family will be whole, I'll be really happy. We can sort of put a weight of expectation, can't we, on a, another human being to meet our heart's deepest desires. It's a weight they cannot bear. They can never do that for us. It will crush them and you in looking for it. Do you know, I think one of the big ones in our day, in our culture, I think it's the idol of education. I think education has become an idol uh, where we, 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 we look like if we, can, if we can just get our kids and parents, we, we drive ourselves insane with this, don't we? The worry of it. Like if I can just get my kids to the, the very best school and, and if only they can achieve the very best grades, then, then that will set them up. And, and that pathway will that'll provide the foundation for, for a happy and fulfilled and successful life. Rob Parsons, uh, in one of his books on parenting, he says this. He says, be very careful how you read school reports. School reports measure 
They grade children in a very narrow bandwidth of ability. Essentially, they end up giving them a, a letter or a number, don't they? And that, that, that quantifies a child. He says, imagine the kid who, age nine, sort of goes back home to his parents and, and he's encouraged to learn his nine times tables. He says, but there's, there's just no point in learning my nine times tables, is there? Because everyone's now got a phone with a calculator on it. And the parents go, yeah, but, but, but what about the time when you're out, maybe with a friend in the shops, and, and you haven't got your phone or your phone's run out of battery? What will you do then? Quick as a flash, the kid goes, well, I'll just ask the kid next to me. You'll learn all that stuff. So, you know, no report card can ever quantify that. But as Rob Parsons says, but maybe that kid has, has a little bit of savvy that will just see him through. I think as parents, we've got to be really careful. And as grandparents, we've got to be really careful that we don't accidentally teach our kids that the most important thing in their lives is what the grade number is when they get to the end. Maybe it's leisure. Maybe it's leisure and pleasure. Uh, maybe it's retirement. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm not one of those Christians who thinks Christians can't retire. Like, if, if you want to stop being paid and stop doing it, like, that's totally up to you. I mean, essentially, we never retire from serving God. Right? Whatever we're doing, we're, we're always serving God. For some of us, it's, it's, it's the next experience. It's, it's, the, it's that travel. It's, it's the list of countries we want to go to. And, and that's what we're really living for. That, that's what's going to really give us the experiences to fill us up. The anticipation of the next trip or the next thing, whatever it is. Some of you may have bucket lists. Have you heard of bucket lists? Um, bucket lists are these, these lists of things that you want to do before you kick the bucket. Things you do before you die. And there's nothing wrong with having a bucket list. It's okay. But let me, let me slightly provocatively suggest to you, if you've got a bucket list, you may also have a lousy eschatology. What do, what do I mean by that? Eschatology is the doctrine of, of the last things, of, of the direction of where we're headed, that points us ultimately to a, to a physical new heaven. And a new earth, a new creation where we'll have all eternity to finish your bucket list. You don't have to do it all now. You don't have to have every experience now. You'll have all eternity to do these things. Maybe it's financial security. And, and maybe it's that at the moment with everything that's going on, cost of living and, and all those worries. Think of, actually, I, I need to get my finances sorted. That's the, that's, that's the idol. That's, that's the thing I will serve with everything I've got. And that'll, that'll do me. Maybe it's even politics and politicians. And again, there's nothing wrong, is there, with a keen interest in politics. But as I, as I watch, what happens in a society when you take God out? Who, who meets all the needs? We end up looking to politicians, don't we, to provide more and more and more. I was watching one of these Question Time things a little while ago. Struggling to sleep, I thought that'll do the trick. So I was watching Question Time, and um, every question, every question to the politicians was, was, how will you sort this need? How will you meet my expectation? How will you give me this or my community that? And I'm watching it thinking, they can't. They, they just can't. They're just people. It's crazy to, to put that weight on them, to expect them to meet every one of, of all of the needs and desires and hopes and dreams and aspirations we have. They are not gods. They're God-ordained servants, but they're not gods. We can't, we can't live our lives serving at the political shrine, hoping they'll meet everything we want. There's loads of ways, aren't there? There's loads of, of these little idols. And we, we'll hold on to God. We'll hold on to Yahweh. We'll worship Jesus. But we'll also have some of these other things, which perhaps take up just a bit too much of your time, attention, effort, and resource as you, as you point yourselves in their direction in the belief that they will fill you. And here's the re real challenge. For those of you that are parents or grandparents, most of these things, none of this is taught. It's all caught. It's all caught. You, you, can, you can tell your kids and your grandkids what you like, but they'll see, they'll see what you really live for. They'll see it. If it's, if it's career, they'll see it. 
if it's leisure and pleasure and material possessions, they'll, they'll see it. If it's education, they'll see it. All of, all of this stuff. It's way more caught than it's ever taught. So what do they see in us? What do they see in you? Where, where are the idols? The idols need to be buried, don't they? That's what Jacob does. Jacob says, bring the idols, bring the earrings, bring all the ill-gotten gains, bring all of that stuff, and we bury it, and we leave it behind. Verse 5, they, they set out, they bury the idols under the oak, and they set out. It's, it's, it's got to be put to death, it's got to be buried. In the words of the hymn, all I once held dear, build my life upon, all this world reveres and wars to own, all I once thought gain I've counted loss. Spent and worthless now compared to this, knowing you. It's got to be buried and it's got to be left. Get rid of anything holding you back in your journey with Jesus. Bury it. Get rid of it. Walk away from it. Second heading then is Follow God with everything you've got. They, uh, they journey on, they set out. Now, we're told that the terror of God fell on the towns as he's kind of protecting them in their journey. And they come to, to Luz, Bethel, and they, they build an altar. And then after Jacob returns from Padan Aram, God appeared to him again and blessed him. And says to him in verse 10, God said to him, your name is Jacob, but you will no longer be called Jacob. Your name will be Israel. So he named him Israel. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful. Increase in number. A nation and a community of nations will come from you. And kings will be among your descendants. The land I gave to Abraham and Isaac I also give to you. And I'll give this land to your descendants after you. And then God went up from him at the place where he had talked with him. Do you see all of, all of God's grace and, and all of the promises is kind of reiterated and repeated for him. But do you notice now it comes with a responsibility. He says, Jacob, I've, I've brought you thus far. My grace has pursued you. I've given you the promise. You've got the birthright. You've got the blessing. You've got the abundance. But notice here, this time... There's a command, there's a responsibility. Of course, the, as we know, the, the command is, is not that he's going to earn anything. It's, it's he's been given it all. But here's the responsibility. Be fruitful. Be fruitful. It's interesting, isn't it? If, we, um, if you've got a Bible and you just flick back a few pages to chapter 28. And um, this is when Isaac prays for Jacob before sending him off. Having been sort of deceived out of the blessing, he now sort of prays it over him. And um, as he does that, chapter 28, verse 3, May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and increase your numbers until you become a community of peoples. The promise is almost kind of exactly the same as it is here in chapter 35. But you notice in 28, Isaac says, May God make you fruitful. And here in chapter 35, God says, be fruitful. Which is it? It's both. It's both, isn't it? If we were, if we were doing a little kind of A-level philosophy class here, uh, we might talk about some ph- philosophical concepts like determinism or libertarianism or compatibilism. Determinism is, is this idea that, well, well, God has determined everything anyway. It's, it's all laid out. He's mapped it all out. Nothing can be changed Uh, every aspect of your life is already determined, so really you might as well just let go and let God. I don't think the Bible gives us permission to to sit there. You swing the pendulum the other way, you come all the way over the other side, and you've got libertarianism. And libertarianism says, well, well, you're free. You're free to kind of make your own destiny. and, And God kind of sits in heaven watching, crossing his fingers, hoping you'll do the right thing, but but you're free. You're at liberty. The Bible says no. No, you can't have that one either. And in the middle is is this idea that theologians sometimes call 
Uh, it's, it's a paradox. It's the paradox of compatibilism. And compatibilism says actually both things are true at the same time. You may not understand. You may not be able to kind of figure that all out neatly. There's a tension to be held on to. It says the Bible teaches both, so I will hold both. God is absolutely sovereign and in control. Not, not, not a kind of a, a sparrow falls to the ground apart from his will. But we are also called as responsible agents to make good decisions, to follow after him. And so we hold both these things. If someone says to you, does God make you fruitful? Or are you to be fruitful? You say yes. Yeah, both. Both things are true. God is going to make him fruitful. But he is called to be fruitful, to take his responsibility seriously. And fruitfulness is one of those really big Bible themes, isn't it? Uh, we, we kind of see it here and, um, and earlier in Genesis. In fact, the very first commandment in the Bible, Genesis 1.28, is be fruitful. First commandment, be fruitful. And here it, it seems to be about um, kind of physical descendants, it increasing as a nation. But it's a much bigger theme than that. If we step back and we, if we read all of our Bibles, you know, the, the Bible is a unity. It's, it's, it's all God breathes. It's all his story. If we read the whole Bible, start to finish, fruitfulness is a huge theme. It appears again and again and again. And it's not just about having lots of kids. When we get to the, the prophets, the, the prophetic critique of the people of Israel is they haven't been fruitful. It doesn't mean they've not had enough kids. Isaiah 5 uses this image of a vineyard that God has planted. It's Israel. But as he comes to visit it, what he finds is it's just born bad fruits through idolatry, through injustice. In Isaiah 11, God is, God is going to tell them, actually, he's, he's going to have to bring forth some new fruit, a stump of Jesse that will bring forth fruit. It, it points to Jesus, the one who will, who will bring ultimate fruitfulness. He will be the vine in which we are, we are joined. This theme carries forwards into the, the New Testament, doesn't it? John chapter 15, verse 4. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Galatians 5 it gives us that list of what it means to be fruitful. Isn't it? It's the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. So it means to be fruitful. Colossians 1 tells us this in verse 6. The gospel is bearing fruit. And a few verses later in verse 10. Live a life worthy of the Lord. Please him in every way. Bearing fruit in every good work. Front to back. The Bible tells you and I to be fruitful. It's a, it's a grand vision of what it means to, to live empowered by God's Spirit to the praise and glory of His name. And it'll look different for each one of us, won't it? A few years ago as a church, we did a really helpful little course produced by the London Institute of Contemporary Christianity, uh, written by Mark Green, who was here last week, called Fruitfulness on the Front Line. It's such a beautiful concept because it says, look, each one of you has a mission. It's not just for people overseas. Each one of you has a front line where God has placed you. It's no accident. He has called you. He has given you certain gifts and abilities. He says, I want you to bear fruit there. It, we've got to get away from this thing, haven't we? If, and if, if, you, if preachers tell you this, just push back a little bit. This, we, we're terrible at it, really. We, we, we give you this idea of, look, you go out and do a secular job, earn money, give some of it to me, and I'll do the real mission work. The Bible doesn't see it that way. The Bible says you've got a front line. You've got the Holy Spirit. God has given you gifts. He's given you an opportunity. How can you bear fruit exactly where God has put you as you go home? Maybe just the, the integrity and skill with which you do your job. Maybe the way in which you relate to neighbours. Your care for an ageing parent. Your service of a, a community outreach 
team like we were hearing about earlier. It could be a million different ways, couldn't it? How, how can you bear fruit as you go back in that place God has put you? Maybe ask him, God, show me. How can I be more fruitful? It's not just about sharing our faith. Though we will obviously want to do that. It's a whole, whole big picture of living for Jesus. Henri Nguyen, the Christian writer, said this, we are called to be fruitful, not successful. They're different things. Success comes from human strength and human effort. Fruitfulness comes from vulnerability and weakness. And when I first read that quote, I had to kind of think about it and think, is that, is that true? Is that always true? Does fruitfulness always come from vulnerability and weakness? And the more I think about it, the more I think, I think that's right, isn't it? Our fruitfulness is, is born out of our rootedness, our dependence on another for everything we need. What is the most fruitful act that has ever taken place? It's got to be the death of Jesus on the cross, hasn't it? The greatest weakness, the greatest vulnerability, bearing the most fruit. It's that sense, isn't it, of God's power being made perfect through weakness, of his grace being thoroughly sufficient for us. As we embrace our weakness, our our finiteness, our our limitedness, our, our dependence on him for every breath, our vulnerability, that's the place from which we can be truly fruitful. I went to visit a, a couple a while ago to, to talk through something. As we finished, they asked me, which was really sweet, they said, Martin, um, how can we pray for you? And I said, uh, yeah, well, that's a great question. Uh, if I'm honest, we really are like, at the moment, I, I don't feel like I quite know how to do my job. Pastor of a church, I don't really know what I'm doing. There's, there's too many plates spinning. There's too many demands. I, I don't know where to start. I don't know where to invest what, what I'm supposed to do. I just, I just feel like I'm not really doing it very well. I don't know what to do. And they prayed for me. And as they prayed, really sweetly, they, they prayed, thank you that Martin feels like that. Because that's a good place to be. And as I walked home and thought about it, I thought, yeah, right. And, and, and as I was walking home, this, this kind of prayer came into my head, which, which I kind of written down in the back of one of my books and I. I keep praying. And the prayer is this, and it's a bit of a dangerous prayer to pray, really. It's, I, I keep praying, God, give me a healthy sense of my own inadequacy and a serenity in your sovereignty that I may not become proud or prayerless. Lord, give me a healthy sense of my inadequacy. Not, not an unhealthy sense, but, but a healthy sense of, of my inadequacies, the reality of what it means to be a human. Serenity in your sovereignty. He's in control. That I don't become proud or prayerless. Which is the temptation, isn't it? If we, if we don't recognise our needs, well, if it goes well, I'll be proud. And if things are okay, I'll be prayerless. I need that sense of, of vulnerability. I, I, I see a bit more of Jacob in me. If I'm to be truly Fruitful. Simon Sinek is is a secular author. He's not a Christian, but he wrote a a well-known book a few years ago called Start Start With Why. That's the title of the book, Start With Why. And in the book, he's arguing this. He's saying, look, many companies start with what? They start with what is the thing I'm selling? What is the service I'm providing? And Simon Sinek says, most people don't really buy into your what. They buy into your why. Start with why. Why do we exist? As the Westminster Larger Catechism puts it, what is the chief end of man? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. Think about your why. Maybe if, if, I, if I'm permitted to give you homework, as you go home next week, if you can find a little bit of chair time in the next week with a cup of coffee and a bit of quiet, how would your why shape your what? If you start with this this sense of, why am I here? If I'm here to be fruitful for God, to enjoy him and glorify him, how would that shape my what? 
of my days and, and my weeks and my months and my years. As we draw toward a, a close, I want us to just notice one more thing in chapter 35. And um, chapter 35 is a lovely chapter because we, we see Jacob, Jacob has turned. We see that he's getting rid of the idols, that he's, he's going to pursue fruitfulness. But it isn't just a sort of a, a triumphal, victorious march to the end. I don't know if you picked it up in the reading or in the next little section too. But the chapter also has three deaths and a disgrace. We see Deborah, verse 8, Rebecca's nurse died and is buried. We see in the next bit, we didn't read it, chapter 35, verse 17 and 18. His wife Rachel dies in childbirth. In chapter 22, while Israel was living in that region, his firstborn, Reuben, went in and slept with Jacob's concubine, Bilhah. And then at the very end, Isaac himself dies at the age of 180. It's just one of those little little reminders, isn't it? Life doesn't necessarily get easier when you decide to really pursue following God with everything you've got. The, the obedient saint who gives it all isn't necessarily promised an easy, happy, healthy life of blessing and rewarding right now. The most obedient of, state of saints still marches heavenwards accompanied by death and sorrow and sin and sadness. As the writer Richard Baxter put it, a gale of groans and a, store, a stream of tears, a gale of groans and a stream of tears will accompany us to the very gates and there they will bid us farewell forever. But only there. We see God's relentless grace pursuing Jacob all the way to the very end. Let me, let me end with um, one more story. It's a story um, told by a, an American pastor and writer called John Altberg about a missionary lady called Evelyn Brandt who was uh, born here in England in 1909. And at age 30, she went over to the mission field in India. While she was there, uh, she met a, a fellow missionary, a young man called Jesse, Jesse Brandt. And, uh, and they married and they, they began to do difficult missionary work. They, were, they brought education. They, they brought care. They taught people about Jesus. But it wasn't easy. It took them seven years to see their first converts. Seven years. And it was when one of the, kind of the tribal chiefs and priests got sick. And everyone else abandoned him because they didn't want to get it. They didn't want to get his fever. And as he was dying, he, he said of Evelyn and Jesse, he said, surely your God must be the true God because only you have come and only you care. It formed something of a, of a breakthrough for them as they saw a steady trickle of, of converts as their, as their influence spread. But after 20 years, Jesse, aged 50, got Blackwater fever and he died. And, and many people thought at that point Evelyn would, would return home. She's now a single lady, 50 years old. And uh, people thought, it, it's, it's hard. You know, it's, it's a difficult work. She'll, she'll come back. But she didn't. She stayed. She worked on her own. She went from village to village, teaching and, and caring and, and speaking of Jesus. And she kept doing that for another 20 years. She was 70 years old. And at that point, the mission board said, we're not going to give you another term. We're not going to give you another five-year term. It's time to retire. And they threw her a little retirement party, kind of where she was, and they, they gave her this, this little lamp as a, as a gift. And, and she turned to, to one of her friends there, and she said, can I tell you a secret? She said, I'm not going home. I'm staying here. 
And she saved up enough money that she could, she could build herself a little shack. And she bought a pony. And, and for five years, she traveled around on, on this pony from village to village, teaching, caring, speaking. Age 75, she fell off the pony and broke her hip. And her son, who was a doctor, Dr. Paul Brand, came. He said, Mum, you've had a great run. It's, it's time to go home. She said, I'm not going home. I've asked God to give me another mountain. Do you know, she stayed. She kept ministering for another 18 years until she was 93. At the end of her life, she was so weak, but she was so loved that the locals would carry her around on a little stretcher. And she'd speak of Jesus wherever she went. And in the words of John Holberg, at Granny Brand, as they called her. She never retired. She just graduated. It's a beautiful picture, isn't it, of, of somebody whose life has been touched, so, so touched and transformed by the grace of God that her gratitude inspires her to be fruitful to the very end. I want to close by using uh, a prayer. It's an ancient prayer written over a thousand years ago that perhaps sums up something of what we've been thinking about over these last five days. So if you join me. God, be in my head and in my understanding. God, be in my eyes and in my looking. God, be in my mouth and in my speaking. God be in my heart and in my thinking. God be at my end and at my departing. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much, Martin, for what you brought to us this morning and this week. Let's, uh, let's stand as we respond together. I love that prayer. God, give me a healthy sense of my inadequacy and give me a serenity in light of your sovereignty. We want to be following God wherever he'd lead us. And we're going to sing in closing now, um, Be Thou My Vision. And it's a prayer. Lord, would you be my vision? Would you guide me? Um, as we sing this, we don't just sing words. We sing to our God and make this your prayer as we sing it.
Please sit down. Almost to the end of the Bible reading. If the Lord's been saying something particularly to you, how I can be fruitful, how I can throw things off, there's a prayer team would love to pray with you, my right, your left. Or of course, do head to base camp, talk to some of the mission team there. How can I be fruitful in my life? And if you're joining online, you want to send a prayer request in, as before, prayer at keswickministries.org. We'd love to pray for you. If you're heading home after this morning's uh, Bible reading, may the Lord give you safety as you travel. God bless and have a great uh, next stage of what the Lord has for you. Look forward to seeing you next year. Of course, got our evening celebration here tonight, our last uh, meeting of the Keswick Convention 2022. We'd love to see you 7.30 here in the main tent. Now let's finish with a final prayer, shall we? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.
the light. 